Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! To start, this is about the company I work for and a trip I took because I had to wire a building for a computer network because the building owner wouldn't. Backstory. Our company was moving a remote site to a new building. As the IT guy for the company, I was asked to look at the new building and get network ports marked out. The landlord refused to put in any low voltage lines. And we got quotes. But they were thousands of dollars. Enter me, my car, and four boxes of CAT 6 plenum. It's about an 8 hour drive and I was doing about 30 drops. Not a ton, but still, a few days work in some place that's already built up. And it's drop ceiling with insulation on top. Missy, itchy work. The story. Day one, we get there Monday morning at the start of the month. It's actually a cool summer morning and we're from further south. So no one notices the AC not working for about an hour. Slowly, the building begins heating up. It gets to 80 by noon, 85 at 3 p.m. The rooms with floor to ceiling windows are greenhouses. It is absolutely miserable. We've been told by the workers still on site that the leasing company was told there was no AC in our building three weeks ago. The other thing is there are still workers on site. The building isn't completed. So much for being ready for a handover day one. Day two. We're getting agitated. It's 80 degrees in the AM when we first wake up. It's 80 degrees in the AM when we first walk in. It's sweltering. It's sweltering. The other guy that came up with me is a facilities manager. He's screaming at people over the phone to fix the AC. We're all exhausted from the heat by 3 p.m. I found a four foot hole in the ducting when I opened the ceiling tile. The AC was blowing, but there was no cold air. We are told the compressor is broken. Day three, more of the same, miserable in the morning. I'm finally getting the last lines punched in on the patch panel. The AC guys arrive about 10 a.m. They finally fix the unit at 2 p.m. We asked them what they did, and they said a lot of things. We again said, what did you do? The reply was, we can't tell the tenants. Red flag alert. We contacted our realtor. She said she would look into what was done. She sends an email later that night that says, they changed the refrigerant from R22 to R410A. I told the facilities guy, no way, dude. That's like putting gas in a diesel motor. They'd have to change out the entire system. They didn't do that in four hours. They basically duct taped in WD-40 that thing back together and it will run poorly for a month or so, then give out. And we'd be stuck with a replacement. Day 4. Still no running water to some areas, still workers on site, and the AC can't keep up with the noonday sun and it still hits around 80 by the end of the day. AC runs continuously. We're packing up all the stuff we moved in and moving out. I notice all the fire sprinklers look like they have moved, and the metal protection around the drop tile has fallen to the floor. Sprinklers are no longer protruding from the tiles in places. The sprinklers are no longer protruding from the tiles in places. In others, they are quite a bit lower than they were. Yep, the AC fools stood on the fire sprinklers to fix their lousy duct work. We are looking for a friendly way out. We contact the landlord and say, you haven't delivered the finished building. We're moving out. The lease is broken. The landlord has a 36-page lease. The landlord won't let us out of the lease. It's five years. This is not starting off well. We get in contact with the corporate lawyer and the realtor. They both agree we're kind of screwed. We are desperate for any way out. I started looking at the fire system. I used to run all kinds of low voltage lines, fire, security and so on. There is no fire panel in our portion of the building. No smoke detectors are hooked up to anything. More red flags. One of our employees that was moving the heavy gear says, Oh yeah, I am meant to mention. I never saw any building permits anywhere. Ding ding ding. They did this build out, including demolition, running new plumbing and power lines and destroying the fire system without a city permit. 
Cue the call to the city inspector's office. Day 5. I wasn't here for this part, but the facilities manager told me this. The city inspector pulled the permits for the building. There weren't any. He finds multiple violations of city code. Red tagged our area, removed the certificate of occupancy, and when I told him to check the fire system like you said, he just goes, Oh, no, 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 no. I have to make a call. He calls the fire marshal. Day 8. Fire marshal arrive on scene, find no active alarm system in our portion of the building. Red tag. Find the sprinkler riser for the entire building in our area. No water pressure. No water pressure. Condemn the entire building. Basically, they wouldn't let us enter the building because we signed the lease, even though they never delivered the building in any semblance of work in order. Called the building inspector, got them smoked, who then called the fire marshal, who condemned the entire building. They are still trying to fight us over it, but we're pushing for them not only to refund the deposit and the rent, which they have already done, but for all the time spent moving gear in and out and all the wiring. Our lawyer says they don't have a leg to stand on and he is happy for them to pay his fees as well. I've been enjoying this sub for a while, so I wanted to share this little story. I live in a small town next to a city that really has a little town feel to it, but not without it feeling like I am living in the boonies. I moved into my house 15 years ago on a street that has maybe 5 houses on it. I get along with everybody near me to the point that we have a street party 3 times a year to get to know each other. The one no-show is always a guy that lives across from me. Let's call him passive-aggressive neighbor. He owns and lives in a duplex that is kind of tucked behind some trees and has a paved driveway that leads to it. But it's open enough that I can see his renter's side of the house. He's the one guy that has lived on this street longer than me. For the first 10 years, I never saw this guy. He was a recluse, and I recognized that. The first strange thing that happened was when I hired painters to paint my house. Even though I have ample parking, for some reason the painters wanted to park on his side of the street. The next day, concrete blocks were lined up on the side of the street of his property, which was kind of ridiculous considering a car has never ever parked there in the 10 years I had lived there. Also, as I said, his house is down a long driveway, but whatever. Like I said, I have plenty of parking, and at the time I thought it was funny. Now, my revenge story. A year and a half ago, my wife received a letter with no return address and no name in the letter. What it was, was a passive, aggressive letter saying, Hello, ex. My name's wife. You are a person that knows a lot of people around here. Can you please make sure these boys stay off my property? And in this letter were printed photos of three boys. One of them was our seven-year-old son. One of the other boys was my son's friend that lived next to this guy and the boys were using his driveway to cut to his friend's house. Now, I was thinking the guy could have had some poles and knocked on my door and talked to me, but it was a fair enough request. So the three boys and their parents had a meeting in my house where we told them under no reason are they to go on his property again. All the boys said, okay, no problem. It was during this time I found out that the father of the son's friend had an ongoing legal battle with a passive-aggressive neighbor about the property line. Two days later, I get a knock on my door and it was another neighbor that lived down the road and he handed me a printed sign saying, if these boys are seen on my property again, I will call the police. And printed on it were the same three pictures of my son and his friends. The friendly neighbor then told me that this was posted on every power line a street light post in a six block radius. So the nice neighbor and I walked around and removed all of them. But I was pissed. Who does that? So I took all the signs and the passive aggressive neighbor letter to the police station. The officer basically said he's a bad neighbor but he did nothing illegal. I again talked to my son and asked him if he had been on his property again. And he said no way. I then showed him the letter and the signs and told him this guy is pretty creepy. Please stay away. So in the time from this incident to last summer, nothing has happened. But the father of my son's friend suddenly passed away. This forced my son's friend and his mom to move away. This summer, my son, now nine, 
was playing in front of my house when a young boy came from the renter's side of this house and said that him and his single dad just moved in. So of course, they became good friends. I then told the boy's father the whole story about his landlord and my son and in no way can he ever come to his house. But his son is welcomed anytime in mine. About a month later, single dad comes to our house and shows me one of the passive-aggressive neighbor's famous letters about his lease. It is for only two parking spots and he's violating his lease. I guess his girlfriend had been parking on the driveway. With plenty of space, I might add at night mostly. Also, he was working on his motorcycle, which is also against his lease. Single dad had been living there for one month and was already getting evicted. So here was where I could get my revenge and told him to go ahead and use my land for his girlfriend to park and to work on his bike. A couple of days later, I get a knock at my door and it's a man I have never seen before. It turns out to be the passive aggressive neighbor and he wanted to discuss his tenant's girlfriend parking in front of my house. I told him that I gave him slash her permission to park there. He then started to argue with me and I said, Hey, look, I don't own the land in front of my house. The city does. What do you expect me to do? Put cement blocks in front of my house or take a picture of the girlfriend and post it everywhere? I then told him to get lost and slam the door in his face. Next week, I get a text. Single dad's girlfriend car. The single dad's girlfriend's car had been entered. She didn't lock it. And the glove compartment had been rifled through. An old phone was taken and another passive-aggressive unsigned letter saying not to park there. So, with no proof, the police could not do anything to his landlord and said it was a civil matter. Luckily, I had a camera set up on my house and I sent a video of the passive-aggressive neighbor going through her car and I emailed it to the single dad with a statement of what the jerk neighbor has done to us in the past. The single dad moved down a week later but went ahead and sued his landlord. I just found out that with the help from me, the single dad won his lawsuit and got $8,000 from the neighbor. It all starts with me missing some groceries and deciding to take a trip to the local store to grab what I needed like any normal human being would. I took my car and drove for 10 minutes until I reached the store's parking lot. Yet when I got there, things weren't as normal and definitely farthest from being quiet. Two ladies were going hard at each other in the parking lot about parking, I guess. One of them was supposed to park in a certain spot and apparently the other one managed to squeeze her car in there before she got to it. Something like that. They were screaming at each other but like one minute after I got there, it escalated real quick. One of them, a huge blonde lady, definitely with a caring attitude, goes back to her car, reaches down for her compartment and pulls a gun out of there. I was still in my car by this point and I know that I wasn't actually the one fighting but I kind of got scared and wasn't able to get myself to drive out of this dangerous situation. I saw some bystanders pick up their phones and they seemed to be talking to a dispatcher, describing the current situation at this exact location. All while Karen, the woman with a gun, was waving her weapon around and threatening the other lady to shoot her down right in front of her kids that were in a car. The smaller lady didn't actually back down from the Karen with a gun. And now, I don't know if that was courage or stability, but I kind of respect her bad, but also just wished that she went away and completely defused the situation. Looking around, there were other people just like me waiting in their cars for this fiasco to end. I don't think we were that curious and it was like watching a movie. For me personally, I was keen on not making a sudden move with my car in front of a triggered person holding a gun in their hand. I didn't want to know if she was crazy enough to shoot at me, if she felt threatened by my car moving out of there or not. I just half ducked in my car and watched carefully for a good 5 minutes. First to arrive at the scene was a female cop that seemed to be by herself. She got out of her car, pulled her weapon out, pointed it at Karen and started yelling at her to drop her weapon down. At first, Karen seemed like she had no care in the world that a police officer was in fact pointing a gun at her but was really intimidating enough that I myself was shaking in my boots inside my car away from all that mess. Then after a minute or so, it looked like she was finally ready to comply with the cop's orders. 
She started going slowly to the ground, placing her gun down near her, raised her hands back up, and was laying straight on her front exactly as the cop instructed her to do. When she was done, the cop carefully approached her, put her gun back in the holster, pulled her handcuffs out and started grabbing Karen's hands behind her back to proceed with cuffing her. And just as everyone around thought that this situation was finally and thankfully over, Karen, who was easily 300 plus pounds, swiftly flipped around and held the 170 pound at best female officer by the arm and managed to slam her flat on her back on the ground instead after some struggling for a few horrifying seconds. Then she started swinging at the cop like no tomorrow. The cop at this point was guarding her head with both of her hands. I would try to reach to her belt whenever she had a chance, but Karen was just clearly too damn heavy for her to shake off. Then when Karen seemed to be done with throwing punches, she now decides to reach out for the officer's gun. And even though the cop was trying to stop her from snatching her gun, Karen was able to finally put her hand on the holster. But before she could get a proper hold of the weapon, a big muscular Samaritan shows up out of nowhere and choke holds Karen from behind her. But when she finally takes her hands off of the cop to desperately try to remove his arms from around her neck and break free from his solid headlock, he starts pulling her off of the female officer and drags her back while maintaining the choke hold and finally smashes her head into the pavement the moment he notices that the cop finally recovered I was ready to make an arrest while he holds the wannabe screaming banshee but can't because she's choking down. As a female cop finished cuffing her, more police cars started to show up to the scene and around three officers grabbed Karen and got her in one of their cars. The female officer was being checked by the paramedics and the other cops were having a friendly but clearly serious chat was a heroic Samaritan who saved the day and prevented this town from experiencing a horrific incident that was literally a few scratches and punches away from happening. I couldn't help but keep up with the updates on this horrible incident that happened right in front of my eyes. Last I checked, Karen was sentenced to 15 years in prison for an aggravated assault on a police officer, among other serious charges. And the Samaritan that saved the cop's life that day was rewarded by the police department and the city for what he did. I am very thankful that karma was served to that woman that day. I mean, 15 years in prison is extremely painful and all but the satisfying part for a non-violent person like me was in fact the suffering she was clearly in when she was in mad chokehold and couldn't break out of it to save her life. Maybe that's what she needed to fully grasp how the other people that she hurt really felt. Anyways, sorry for taking too long to tell my tale. I hope you enjoyed it. Warning. There is no hero in this story. A guy who was a jerk to me and I was a bigger jerk back. Honestly, I probably went too far. One day I got a sales call from this company I'm investing with, trying to sell me more investments. Wasn't against it, so I let the sales guy talk, asked my questions, and told him I wasn't interested once it became obvious it wasn't what I wanted. This guy was persistent though. He kept asking why I wasn't interested then told me he was going to email me a bunch of documentation to help me make my decision. So he emails me some stuff that I don't read and calls me again the next day. I tried to politely tell him that this was a, a waste of both our time, but then it got weird. Let's call this guy Jack. Did you even read any of the stuff I sent you yesterday? No, like I told you, I am not interested. So you're a liar then. Excuse me? He went on to complain because according to him, I told him I was going to invest in his offer, but then pulled out at the last minute. I told him I didn't say anything of the sort, I simply let him make his pitch, then told him I wasn't interested. Just because he pushes and follows up against my will doesn't magically change any of this. Secondly, this call is crazy unprofessional. How are you going to survive in sales if you start yelling at everyone who says no to you? The call gets really heated at this point, I think my guy was holding in some serious frustration because he unloaded a bunch of insults on me in a wildly disappropriate way. In response, I start needling and insulting him back, infuriating him further, culminating in him reading my address over the phone to intimidate me and making threats about how he's going to come over and kill me. It wasn't my address, it was my office address, but the intent 
was there. I was pissed after this and not being able to let it go, I weighed my options. Sending in a complaint was the easiest option. That would almost certainly have led to him getting punished for it, but it was also way too formal and impersonal. For the sake of my ego, I needed the satisfaction of actually delivering a personal blow. So, knowing what offices and sales teams are like, I decided to embarrass him. I run my own business and we send a lot of cold emails. As such, I have access to a bunch of tools and processes to gather email addresses from a given business domain. I get to work, find about 60 company emails, and box send the following email to everyone on this list except for Jack. Hi there. I am trying to reach Jack in sales. Please forward this to him if you know him, as I don't have his email. Hi Jack. Just following up on our phone call from earlier today. The one where you called me a lying idiot and a son of which because I didn't want to give you money. Then read out my address over the phone and threatened to kill me. I know it's frustrating when you don't make a sale, but whining about it and insulting the lead isn't going to help you. Not long after the email fiasco, I got a call from someone I didn't expect to hear from. A higher up manager at the investment company. His tone was apologetic and serious, a stark contrast to the fiery exchanges with Jack. I want to extend my deepest apologies for the distressing experience you've had with one of our sales representatives. The manager began. We hold our employees to a high standard of professionalism. And it's clear that, in this instance, those standards were not met. He paused, perhaps expecting me to interject, but I remained silent, curious about what he would say next. After a thorough investigation, including the emails you forwarded, we've made the decision to terminate the employee in question for his unacceptable behavior. We do not tolerate such conduct towards our clients or anyone, for that matter. This news surprised me, not because I thought it was unwarranted, but because it was rare to see such direct accountability. Furthermore, the manager continued, we understand the severity of the threats made against you. While we've taken internal action, you are free to pursue legal action against him personally. Should you wish to, we can provide you with any documentation or support you may need for this. I mulled over his offer. Pursuing legal action was an option, but it was comforting enough to know that the company had taken my complaint seriously and acted upon it. That was more than I had initially hoped for. I appreciate you reaching out and taking action. I replied, it is reassuring to see that there are still some standards and accountability in place. He says, well, we strive to ensure that all our clients feel safe and respected. The manager said, once again, I am truly sorry for what happened. If there is anything else we can do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. We said our goodbyes and the call ended. It was an unexpected resolution. One that didn't erase the unpleasantness, but did provide a sense of closure. As for Sue and Jack, I hadn't made up my mind. But knowing I had the option, and the company's support was a solace in itself. Ten years ago, I moved for my job. I had forgotten about one of my TVs back home and asked my dad to ship it to me. On my company's account, since they paid for my move. A couple days later, the delivery driver from shipping company A drops it off. The box was heavily damaged, so I didn't sign for it. He waited while I plugged it in and, to no one's surprise, was damaged. He said that he could take it back if I didn't want to sign for it and the shipper could file the claim. I informed him I was a shipper and would file it here. This was a small mistake, but I've shipped thousands of parts through this company, so I figured it wouldn't be a problem. Claim denied a month later. This goes back and forth for a couple of months, with multiple emails to this old lady, and she didn't care at all. She was also very rude to me via email and phone. Now, this shipping company A has two separate entities, parcel and freight. We solely use this freight company for all of our warehouses across the US. I cut them off at my new store and started using company B. It only took a month before the salesman from shipping company A stopped by. When he showed up and asked why he was losing 20k worth of freight a month, I informed him of the $600 broken TV 
from his sister company a couple months back. He said that he couldn't do anything about it since it was a separate side of their company and backed for the business back. No dice. This goes back and forth for several months. Our average was about 20 to 25k a month they would bill us for and it was a small town so they were very upset that it was only over a $600 TV. I got a check in the mail about a year after I shipped the TV along with a letter from their vice president. So I guess this is the pro part. Fast forward a couple years and I've been promoted within the company to make certain decisions and one happens to be logistics. None of our locations use shipping company A anymore. Some months we spend well over 100k but most are around 80k company wide and this has been going on for several years now. We also inform customers to use shipping company B since shipping company B is awesome and treats us very well. Since about 2011 we have used them countrywide. No telling how much shipping company A lost over a $600 TV. So this story was when I was at Aldi Food Market, which surprisingly has a lot of entitled people by the way. I was waiting in line to get checked out, there were two registers open and the lines had about 5 people each. So a decent wait. Our entitled chopper comes by. Looks at the line in disgust and chills in between the lines. I and the rest of us. The third from the front is a mom and a kid. The mom semi on her cell, but talking to her kid. The entitled chopper eyes this opportunity, and sure enough, as the mom was replying to a text when the line moved, ever so slightly the mom didn't move with it as she was finishing her text. The entitled chopper barrels over and stands in a barely standable spot, cutting the line. The mom realizing the stability of this entitled chopper but also wanting to be polite tells her there is a line. The entitled chopper smugly says, no I will not move, you were on your phone which means you're not in line. At this moment an Aldi employee comes up and begins to speak with the entitled chopper. Ma'am I think there was a misunderstanding but if you leave… But the entitled chopper cuts her off and says, no I will not move, I'm staying in my spot. And if anything, they, just as the mom and her kid, should have to go to the back of the line for poor etiquette. Irony much, Karen? The employee smiles maliciously and says, As you wish, ma'am. He turns to the mom and her kid and says, Excuse me, I am opening a register and can take you next. Please follow me. The entitled chopper pulling both a shocked Pikachu mixed with plopped fish and says, But, but I... But the Aldi employee cuts her off and says, he said you were staying in your spot, so I am taking the next customer. If you have a complaint, feel free to submit one as our online survey. The mom and a kid grinning and following the cashier. The man who was behind them in line follows closely, glaring at the entitled chopper, almost daring her to try and take his spot. The entitled chopper loudly states, unbelievable, and looks at the rest of us for sympathy, but is met with glares or is ignored. Eventually she just bouts, mumbling about poor customer service, which I was able to hear as I now was behind her. The ultimate end to this was that 30 seconds later, when the entitled chopper became second in line and had put three of her items on the belt, another cashier came up and grabbed me, making myself get cashed out before her. This story comes from a friend of mine, Sarah, and has been building for almost 5 years until it all came crashing down over the last week. A few things to note before I get into it. Sarah works at an insurance company, dealing with a massive nationwide delivery company. Her company insures all the delivery trucks. Over the years Sarah had seen her fair share of anger from callers, mostly justified, or people letting off steam at the anonymous voice on the other end of the phone. She's learned not to take it personal. She absolutely despises the owner of one particular franchise depot. We will call him Jerk. On to the story. We start in 2016. Jerk is a franchisee of a vehicle depot for delivery company, meaning he's sort of an owner, but the company's CEO could take away his ownership if they feel like it. I'm not sure exactly how this works, but as far as I understand, it's a fairly standard franchise contract. 
So anyone who knows about these things should have a rough idea of what Jerk has to do. He calls in for the first time to talk to Sarah about a claim one of his drivers is making. Something simple, reversed into a wall, minimal damage, but claiming to get the vehicle repaired. He starts ranting and screaming about how dare his driver be expected to pay an excess. This is standard. Sarah has dealt with people like this all her career, so she just deals with it as she always does. And so it continues for two years, with a jerk bullying and abusing any call handler when he calls about a claim. It's annoying and plenty of people have been brought to tears by it, but they can't stop serving him because he's responsible for dealing with his franchise claims. It's now 2018 and Jerk decides to get himself arrested. To give you an idea of just how stupid this man is, one of his drivers had been in a really bad accident. Nobody was seriously hurt, but the van was badly damaged. So while it was being repaired, Sarah organized for a higher van. He goes to the hire company to collect the van and he is asked to make a one pound payment by debit slash credit card to secure the vehicle. I'm pretty sure it is so the hire company can just charge it for any damage caused while on hire. And is an industry standard in my country. He doesn't like that. He argues with the hire company. He threatens to dump the hire vehicle once he is finished with it. Finally, he pushes a poor bloke work in front desk. As previously stated, the jerk gets arrested. Fast forward to a few months ago. Everyone is working from home, locked down, and most people understand this. Everyone except him. He must be having a particularly bad day because his tantrum about how useless Sarah and her company is descends into personal insults. Sarah, having an equally bad day, decides that now is the moment she will get revenge on this guy for everything he has put every claim handler through. So she requests a copy of the recording of the call. All calls recorded for safety, complaints and calling people out on their bullcrap. She then sends this recording to three people. Her manager saying she refuses to speak to the jerk due to his abusive behavior. The rest of the team agree and suddenly there is not a single claims handler willing to speak to this man. The manager says he will sort something. Jerk's boss simply stating that his behavior is unacceptable. And the next time he tries to speak to someone at the insurance company that way, they will end the call. Every listed CEO or board member of Jerk's company, she wanted all of them to know just how vile this man was. Then today she gets the call she's been waiting for. A representative of delivery company has called. Wanting to apologize for everything Jerk put her and her team through. He also gives the best news. Jerk has been downgraded from franchise owner to a lowly delivery driver. His lovely pay package, benefits, annual bonus and company funded car, a brand new Mercedes, have all been taken away. He now earns a little over minimum wage, 60 hour weeks to pay his bills, with his reputation in tatters. Mm. If he doesn't meet the standard for delivery drivers within the next three months, he'll be fired. Sarah also learned from someone she knows in the company that his wife is divorcing him because he told her she needs to get a job or they will lose a house thanks to his sudden drop in income. Sarah hasn't yet met the new franchisee, but if I know her, she'll make it clear that she's the one who ruined Jerk's life. She isn't afraid to do it again if the new guy doesn't treat her and her colleagues with respect. But listen. Well, don't be a jerk to call center employees. P.S. I want to emphasize for those who have commented on the franchise part of things, I have a very limited knowledge on how this works. As far as me and Sarah know, the jerk started as an employee of this place, then got the money to buy the franchise. There is something in the contracts that allows the company to take away his franchise. And since he was formerly a driver, he was given that job back on probation. Also, for the person who pointed out the description of lowly delivery driver, I should have made this more clear. This is in no way demeaning the job these wonderful people do. It is how Jerk always described the position when he called. I work for the biggest overnight freight company in the country. Every year they put out a staff survey pack. Yes, it was paper. Before they gave everyone email and internet access. 
It wasn't compulsory to participate. If you did it, fill it in. You didn't have to include any personal details. Also, instead of handing it at a local level, you could mail it to a reply paid address interstate at head office. There was also a one-month window for completion. Those that were returned at the office were meant to be in sealed envelopes. No identifying marks in a drop box and sent to head office from there. Around 2007, we had one manager who was absolutely destroying us. The leaving shift uncovered, declining over time, playing favorites, and this led to the majority of the shit slaying him and their survey responses. I had a gut feeling this jerk was destroying all the survey responses that were not favorable to him. I had a busy role and wasn't going to fill it out at work. I did it at home and mailed it back for free to head office interstate one afternoon. That night I got to work. Let's call the bad manager Ben. I complied with a survey request and this is where I like to think the maliciousness comes in. Ben, in the office in front of about 15 other staff said, Hey, um, we haven't got your survey back yet. How do you know, Ben? Well, we haven't got it. But how do you know? They aren't compulsory. They can be anonymous. They are supposed to be sealed. They are not due for another two weeks. They don't go directly to you. So how do you know that you don't have my survey back yet? Fifteen sets of ears have pricked up and all eyes are on him squirming. Well, because it hasn't been returned yet. So I repeated everything I just challenged him with. Is there a secret marking on my envelope to identify my response? A serial number or something? No, it's, it's just... Uh, tell me and everyone here how you know my response hasn't been received yet. Well, it hasn't. The only way you'd know is by opening the packs that come back here. You're not supposed to do that, right? No, I'm not. I don't. Tell you what, Ben. My pack went in the mail to head office this morning. You'll never get hold of it. If you're that worried about my response, don't be. I did not carve you up. And it's pretty clear none of the carve-ups returned here are making it to the head office anyway. Fifteen people are laughing their heads off now. Ben then leaves the room. He watches his step very carefully after that. I refuse to complete any more surveys after that. I don't do the online versions now. A few years later, he tries to misquote me on a phone exchange and put me on a disciplinary warning. As all calls were recorded, I requested he gets the tapes. He refused. And we both knew he was lying and that they would prove it. He got sacked in 2013 and I now work at the head office.